Hello, John. Hello. Hello, everyone. Welcome back for our last session for our first day today. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. It's been fun so far. We've had several good talks. We've had a lot of chatter and discussion um, over on IRC and on YouTube. Um, I was, I've also been hanging out a bit in the hallway track. We were talking some more about release notes and automating some of that process. Sorry, the hallway track laptop is over there. So I keep looking over there. Um, we've been talking about various things and uh, I know we'll probably hang out a bit more. I mean, certainly tomorrow, I think after the session is over, we'll probably spend quite a bit of time continuing some of the discussions of tomorrow in the hallway track. So if you haven't joined yet, I would encourage you go jump on that call, get involved. Um, but now, for the last session today, we're going to, we have a real treat. So Kirk has agreed to give us a good chunk of his time and share so, uh, some stories from early BSD with us. So I don't know if you can see the poll, Kirk. We put up a poll with the three things you had suggested to me. Um, it looks like in the poll so far, the TCP IP wars is a, a majority, not just a plurality. It has over 50% of the vote. So that would be the, seem to be the one that people have most asked for. Okay, well, that's the one I've done the last two times you've listened to it. So you, I, I you as the moderator can say the second choice is this and pick one of the other two if you want. Um, I know that I, I have that ability, but I try not to be a dictator a lot of the time. Um, I think it's, you know, hmm. It's fine if we go with TCP IP wars. I think if we had to pick another one, some of the other people at IRC mentioned that they would really find it interesting to hear your side of the story of the lawsuit, because we know that um, some of the details of the lawsuit were released publicly already, or a few years ago. Now you can actually see uh, the actual legal documents themselves that were filed. But I think um, if we were not to do TCP IP wars, I think probably folks would be interested in the lawsuit story. But I, I think it's also fine to, to hear the well, how about we'll do this? I, I will, rather than totally focusing in on one topic, I will sort of split my time between TCP IP wars and the, the lawsuit. Well, that will totally work for me. Um, so a question that Ed has, uh, are you fine with, any, with all of this discussion being recorded and streamed? Or would you rather some of this not be recorded and streamed? Uh, the, at this point, the lawsuit stuff that I'll be talking about is all out. And as you said, it's, it's been released to the public. So it's, right. it, there's no issues there. Any, there. There was at one time, but there isn't now. My lips have been unsealed. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, I'm going to turn it over to you. And then I'm going to hide myself. And I'll let you go. OK, uh, I do for the people out there in the uh, Zoom land. Uh, I do not have slides. Uh, all I have is some notes. And these, <laughs> the, the, the history of these notes is actually interesting because the very first time I was asked to give this talk was in 1986. Uh, and it was for the Australian Unix Users Group meeting, which was being held in Perth, Australia. And so uh, I actually flew into Melbourne and then from Melbourne took the Indian Pacific train across the country, which takes three days. And so these notes are handwritten notes that I wrote on the train as we were going across the Nullarbor Plain, which is the, the, it, it, the, it's so flat that you can sort of look in the distance and see the curvature of the earth. Uh, it's the longest set of railroad tracks without a bend in the rail it goes on for a hundred and something miles without a bend in the rail. All right, so we'll just kind of uh, blip over the, the early bits. Uh, Unix got started at Bell Labs uh, when uh, Bell Labs had been involved in Multics, but the Multics project uh, had kind of descended into uh, never ending research and they were never really converging on a system. And so Bell Labs withdrew from the Multics project. And uh, at that point, uh, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie were, were stuck with going back to batch processing. And they'd had a taste of, of a interactive operating system and they wanted to continue that. And so they actually started on a PDP-7, uh, which they wrote a, what they called at the time a real-time operating system, mostly so they could write a, a Star Wars type of game. 
uh, and uh, that was eventually called Unix. So there's there's people that debate whether that can be called Unix, but if you go to the Unix Heritage Society, uh, they'll they'll say that was the first Unix. At any rate, they fairly soon moved on to a PDP-11, and uh, the the uh, the PDP-11 was originally written in assembly language, but fairly quickly, um, Dennis came up with the C language and they converted the uh, Unix over to being written in C, which is obviously where it's stayed ever since. So um, that went through several releases uh, and or several versions, they called them. And uh, an early, very early version four arrived at Berkeley. Uh, when uh, Bob Fabry, who had heard about Unix when he went to uh, the uh, conference, the ACM conference on operating systems, where it had been first presented by uh, probably by Ken Thompson. And uh, since Ken, uh, Ken Thompson was an alumnus of Berkeley, uh, Berkeley got a little bit of extra uh, special pull. So, uh, Berkeley got a PDP-11 and got this early version of, of Unix. And Ken Thompson actually came out and did a six month sabbatical at Berkeley. And that's when it really got kind of cemented. Um, that's also when Bill Joy got to Berkeley, uh, matriculated as a student and uh, sort of under Ken's tutelage, got up to speed with Unix and became what you today call the system administrator for the system. Uh, now, Bill started, uh, building a number of tools that ran on Unix, the VI editor, which of course is still with us today, and uh, the Pas a Pascal compiler. And he also uh, was, was not super enamored of the, the shell that was available and so decided to do his own, uh, which he called C shell. And I've always found it somewhat amusing that someone who was getting a PhD in programming languages could come up with a syntax as horrible as the seashell. Uh, but that's, you know, no accounting for how that ended up happening. Anyway, the first uh, BSD distributions uh, were the bill really just packaging up the utilities that he'd written. So the seashell, the editor, the Pascal compiler, and some other things. Uh, and this, so you would just get these utilities and then drop them on your existing Unix system. Uh, so then what ended up happening next was that um, Berkeley got one of the very first VAX computers, uh, actually serial number seven. And uh, it came, of course, with the uh, DEC VMS operating system. But uh, the people at Berkeley really much preferred Unix to VMS. And so uh, Bill basically took a, the quick and dirty uh, hack of something called 32V, which was a port that the folks at Bell Labs did to the VAX, but it didn't utilize any of the paging hardware on the VAX. It was just a swap-based system, just like the PDP-11. Uh, but Bill added a, the VM system that had been done by uh, Olzop Babagalu, and so, took the 32V, added the, the actual uh, VM paging stuff to it, and then packaged that up. And that was released as, uh, the, the, was sort of the first release from Berkeley that was a complete operating system with all of the utilities on top of it. Uh, and that came out as, as 3BSD. And so, uh, you know, 3BSD, was such, you know, was so much better than 32V that 32V generally just wasn't used. People uh, would simply get a license from AT&T for Unix, and then they would just bring up um, 3BSD on it. So uh, at the same time now, uh, there's sort of a, in parallel going on with this is uh, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, which was uh, responsible for the research budget of the various branches of the US military. And the idea was that they, instead of having each branch do their own uh, research projects, they instead pooled all their resources and then had this, this department in DARPA to figure out how it ought to be used. 
So in, the, in doing stuff with computers, uh, what had been sort of the norm up to that point was that every research group sort of had their own computer with their own operating system, their own utilities, the languages they were using differed. And so it was very, very hard to take something that one research group had created and you make use of it by another research group. So DARPA decided that, all right, going forward, we're going to pick a particular piece of hardware, a particular operating system, a small set of languages, and that's what we're going to have all of the people that we do funding for use. And so they decided on the VAX because that was uh, the, the powerful enough, but at a price point that they could afford to buy a bunch of them for all of their various different uh, people that they were funding. Uh, there was a bit of debate then, should they run with the vendor supported operating system VMS or should they run with Unix? Um, there was a great sort of bake off that happened uh, and uh, ultimately was decided that it would be Unix. And so, okay, that's good. But now they needed somebody who was going to stand in and actually get the things they needed in Unix into it. And so for this uh, task, they decided that they would fund Berkeley. So they would fund Berkeley to, to uh, essentially take Berkeley Unix, which had a lot of the things that they already wanted, and then they would get them to add other things that they needed. In particular, they needed a, a, a faster file system. They needed, uh, they wanted networking brought over. Uh, at that point, the only networking that was available in Unix was UUCP, Unix to Unix copy, which was a store and forward over dial-up lines. Uh, and uh, so none of the interactive stuff like say Telnet or any of those things uh, that we would have uh, later. Okay. so. Uh, the oh, the uh, they also wanted to have uh, sort of more features, the MMAP feature in the virtual memory, which didn't exist at that time. So Bill wrote up this architecture for Unix uh, for for BSD, uh, which was you know put together in a month and was really uh, you know if you go back and look at that document today, it it still looks surprisingly uh, accurate for where we ought to be. Um, and so the, uh, the, the dealing with the file system fell to me, and that's another interesting piece of the story, but I'm not going to go through that today. Um, rather, what I want to do is focus in on the networking, because that's going to actually play a role both in this middle part and in the when we get to the lawsuit. So uh, the, the dealing with the networking, was it really was broken into two pieces. One was we had to come up with an API to access it. I mean, all the networking such as it existed other than UUCP at that point was you would open a slash dev and do something with it. Uh, and uh, they, they, they wanted to actually have the networking integrated into the interface. Uh, and that of course was the, in that document that I described that was drawn up by Bill uh, was what the socket interface that we have today. And then of course they needed the, the TCP IP component, which was gonna be one of the protocols that would run under these sockets. Uh, at that time we had NCP, uh, which was built in, you know, it was sort of looked like a device and you opened it up and fiddled with it. Uh, but the, that among other aspects of NCP, it had only a, an eight bit uh, address because I mean, who could imagine that you would have 250 hosts on your network. But uh, it began to, it was becoming clear that maybe that wasn't going to be enough. I mean, you know, there were already like 20 different contractors that DARPA was doing and, you know, that could expand. Uh, so the one of the early debates was uh, how big should the addresses be in TCP IP? And there were three groups. There were the people that said it should be 16 bits, there were people that said it should be 32 bits, and there were people that said it should be 48. Uh, we at Berkeley were in the camp that said it should be 48 because the uh, you know, we were looking to Xerox Park, who were really the leaders uh, in in networking stuff at that time, 
And they had gone from their three megabit ethernet, which had an eight bit station address. Uh, when they went to the 10 megabit ethernet, that they put a 48 bit address on. And in, in their networking uh, model, the station address of the, the ethernet was your address. Uh, and so, you know, you needed 48 bits in order to be able to map obviously to the, to the 48 bits on the, the hardware. Uh, well, the, uh, as you can imagine, uh, with the relatively slow backbones that we had, 50 uh, kilobit backbones, they didn't want to squander having to have 12 bytes of, you know, half of which were going to be zeros all the time for, for add the to and from addresses. And so uh, we, we, we had to compromise and go with the 32 bits. And I think that uh, a lot of the issues of, of trying to switch to IPv6 that we've been struggling with for the last 20 years could have been avoided if we'd simply had 48-bit addresses. But nevertheless, 32 bits it would be. All right, so again, something that in retrospect looks kind of crazy, but they decided, you know, these kids at Berkeley, you know, they, they couldn't possibly be trusted to, to know how to write networking protocols, but we'll let them write, you know, design and write the API because that's just trivial and, you know, doesn't require any thought. Uh, and meanwhile, we're going to get a real company, Volt Burlick and Newman, BBNN, to do the actual protocols itself. So, Anyway, uh, we got to design the, the API, the socket API, and uh, Bill got that hacked together pretty quickly. And so he was now ready to drop in uh, the TCP IP. So he calls uh, Rob Gerwitz at, at BBNN and says, OK, um, you know, we, we need something to test. And Rob says, well, you know, all I got is, you know, this kind of half written prototype here, but uh, I'll send it to you so you can start playing around with it. And uh, so, so Bill, Bill gets it, puts it in. And in, uh, at that point, uh, BBNN was testing over these uh, 50 uh, kilobit backbones, but we had these super fast three megabit uh, ethernet cards that we'd gotten from Xerox PARC. Uh, and we were running on VAC 750s. Those were our test machines. And a VAC 750 is approximately 0 0.7 MIPS. Uh, and you know, a you know, the machines today are thousands of times faster. Your phones are thousands of times faster. Uh, at any rate, uh, the, the, the thing that Rob Gerwitz had designed was this beautiful state machine with, you know, all the states were defined in the, the TCP IP states and it would transition from one to the next and, uh, you know, very modular code, et cetera, but it wasn't very fast. And in fact, uh, when you had your VAC 750 sat CPU saturated, it could only push about, oh, 50 kilobits per per second across this backbone. And Bill's like, well, this is crazy. We ought to be able to do much better than this. So he goes in and just goes hack, 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 you know, so that all the state transitions just turn into go-tos and, uh, you know, it turns into one giant blob of code, but by gosh, it runs quickly. And in fact, can almost saturate the three megabit uh, ethernet. So at any rate, uh, there's a lot of people that want to try it. And so a, a test release of this goes out, something called 4.1a. Uh, and a lot of people start working with it. A lot of bugs start getting fixed. A lot of further performance improvements happen, so on and so forth. So eventually, uh, the folks at BBNN finish up their, their code and send it to us and say, all right, here's the actual thing that you should be using. and. Uh, you know, so we do, you know, we try dropping it in, but, you know, it's super slow and it's got a whole bunch of bugs in it and it looks a lot different than what people have been working on. And so uh, we say, well, you know, thank you, but, you know, what we've got is working uh, considerably better and, you know, we, we, we don't really need that, that final release of yours. Well, the folks at BBNN were not at all amused by this. And so they said, but, but you have to, you know, we're the ones that DARPA paid to do this. And I won't, I'll just note on the side that they were paid four times as much money as Berkeley was being paid. Uh, and so, uh, you know, 
you need to do it. You need to put it in. And so it's, you know, it got to loggerheads and uh, eventually, um, you know, we just released it. We released 4.2 with the, the, the version that we'd been working on. And so at this point, then uh, BBN goes to DARPA and said, look, you know, these people at Berkeley aren't doing the right thing and you need to make them do this. And so the, the, the DARPA folks agreed with them. And so they came to us at Berkeley and said, um, you, you, you need to put the BBN code in. And, you know, Berkeley is, is sort of said, you know, known as being sort of hotheads and not really following orders very well. And uh, so we just said, well, no, I mean, we've done this analysis and no, which is just, it's not the right thing to do. And uh, so anyway, it, it went back and forth for a while, but ultimately it was decided that uh, we would need to have a, we, we, the two sides would agree to a bake-off. And so a neutral third party would be found and would take you know, the two different implementations and run a bunch of tests on them and write up a report. And everybody agreed that they would abide by whatever that decision was of that, of that tester. And so then DARPA uh, you know, runs around and eventually decides that uh, this guy named Mike Moose at the Ballistics Research Laboratory in Aberdeen, Maryland uh, would be the tester. And, you know, Mike Moose was you know, sort of on the inside of stuff at DARPA. And, uh, you know, so BBNN's like, yeah, great, great guy. Well, it turns out that, that Mike Moose had been one of the primary testers of the stuff we'd been doing at Berkeley. So we're like, mm, yeah, fine, sure. That, we'll go with that. So anyway, we send it off. And uh, uh, then, of course, there's the question of what kind of tests ought to be run. Well, you know, what we were testing for was low loss networks with high throughput. That, that was our target goal. But DARPA also had a great deal of interest in what happened when the networks were being disrupted. You know, like say something happened in Chicago and the whole city blew up that it you know, would manage to reroute through Austin, Texas or something. Uh, so one of the tests was to be that sort of at random, about 25% of the packets would just be dropped on the floor. Uh, and how well would it respond to that? Well, that was, of course, not anything that we had tested for. And it was something that BBN had done a lot of work on because that was in the original specification that they'd gotten as something to, to be concerned about. So we're like, OK, well, we're not quite sure how that's going to work out. But um, anyway, um, Mike Moose's report arrives. Uh, with, you know, the, and the first thing you do, of course, is you immediately go to the last page to see what the conclusion is going to be. Um, but it's not there. And so you read the executive summary at the front because that must be there then. Nope, not there. So you actually have to read this report. And somewhere where you get to about the middle is where it starts talking about the testing that's happened. And uh, so the first test, of course, is low loss networks and the, the BSD just absolutely blows the, the BBNN one out of the water as, as expected. But then he starts running the test where, you know, statistically it drops every, about every fourth packet or so. And uh, in this one, of course, the BBNN code just is pulling out way ahead of the, the BSD, which is kind of struggling and falling back and not doing very well. But uh, as Mike Moose says, while the BBN code is rebooting, Berkeley manages to uh, you know, jump forward and in fact finishes more quickly than the BBN code does in getting the data through. So uh, the conclusion then was that it would be the, the BSD uh, code that would go out. And so that essentially put that to rest. OK, so now. Uh, with, the, with that behind us, we, we go on and uh, start working on some of the other things that needed to be done. Uh, this included things like uh, updating the VM system, because in order to be able to do something like MMAP, the, the original implementation just wasn't up to that. Uh, plus, the original implementation was very VAC specific. And so uh, we, we needed to add, you know, we, we need essentially to replace the VM. So choices were we could write our own. Uh, choice number two was to pick something that was already out there that we could adapt. 
and uh, you know, following the, the the philosophy of it's always better to uh, steal a better idea than just come up with your own. Uh, we uh, decided to look around. Uh, this was my task. So the the two obvious candidates were the VM system that had been done by Sun Microsystems uh, and the one that had been done at Carnegie Mellon under Mach. And the we actually liked the the Sun Microsystems one. It was it was better adapted because they were working, you know, it was done within Berkeley Unix, whereas the mock system was part of a microkernel. So uh, we went to Sun, who we interacted with quite, you know, a, a lot of good flow back and forth. And, uh, you know, of course, the engineers were up for it and their managers were up for it. And it sort of trickled its way all the way up to uh, Scott McNeely, who was the CEO. And he, he thought that might not be a bad idea. Uh, and so he uh, asked his, the lawyers to draft something to you know, make that contribution to Berkeley. And the lawyers came back and said, uh, you know, your stockholders could sue you for giving away company assets. So we really don't recommend that you do that. And so unfortunately that was the end of that. Uh, so we were stuck with either doing our own or using mock. So we took the mock code. Of course, we rewrote the interface to have things like MMAP that we needed. Uh, and uh, so that, that went in. Uh, we were very lucky to have uh, Rick Macklem, who uh, did NFS. I had put in the, the, the VFS uh, VOP interface. Uh, and so then, and, and had moved the file system under that. And then Rick, uh, got NFS up and running and plug that in uh, into that interface as well. So all of these things then uh, eventually trickled out as uh, 4.4 BSD. Meanwhile, uh, AT&T had gotten into the, the computer operating system business. Uh, the, this thing called the 1956 dissent decree uh, which essentially said that IBM would do computers and not phones, and AT&T would do phones and not computers. Uh, but with the breakup of AT&T, one of the things they got to do was start doing computers. And so uh, that's when they started commercially uh, selling uh, Unix, which of course was System 3 and then later System 5. And uh, so... In the early days, since they weren't trying to use Unix commercially, uh, getting a, a source license for Unix was on the order of $20,000. And so it was you know, a, a small enough hurdle that people were, were fine with that. But once they got into the computer business, the cost of those source licenses kept rising. Uh, and it had gotten up to about a quarter million dollars. Uh, and that was for like, source on one machine only. And, and so there were all these smaller companies that wanted to build products that had networking in them, TCP IP in them, and they couldn't afford to get the, the AT&T license so that they could get the code from Berkeley. So they came to Berkeley and asked if uh, we could release the TCP IP code because that clearly had been written, you know, that was clearly not part of the original Unix. And so uh, if we would release it as open source, then they could take that and, and adapt it in their products and not have to buy a Unix license. And so we said, well, that, you know, that's not too hard. We went through the kernel and we just took the you know, socket interface and the, all the code and drivers and so on down from top to bottom. And we, we threw in the, uh, you know, the various utilities that we had uh, and Telnet and FTP, and unfortunately also the R commands, for those of you that are old enough to remember things like R login, which was a, a security disaster from the day it was written. Uh, you know, the, the, the security checking was, do you, do you claim to be root? Yes, okay, well, in that case, do whatever you want. Um, so anyhow, this got put together and we did this as a thing called networking release one, net one. And we, of course, had to go to the Berkeley lawyers to get them to write a license or, you know, a, yeah, it, write a document that, you know, would allow its release. And there's huge long amounts of stuff, of, you know, they wanted, like, you know, a 
four or five page copyright. And then we said, you know, this has to go into every single file and this is ridiculous. So we got it down to the, what, you know, looks like a large copyright, but in fact, uh, you know, compared to where we started from, we did pretty well, I think. At any rate, uh, this, this took this better part of a year back and forth with the Berkeley lawyers, but we finally got the, the, everything in place. And we figured this was totally ridiculous because we figured we'd sell like maybe three copies of this and then it would just go all up for you know, anonymous download and that would be it. But it turned out that all these companies were really eager to have a piece of paper that said, you're free to redistribute this. So we actually sold nearly a thousand of these thousand dollar licenses to the various companies that all companies and other organizations that wanted to have that piece of paper, uh, which then gave us a big new chunk of money so that we could continue doing stuff, which was great. Uh, at any rate, um, we went on and uh, once we had done the release of TCP IP, people were saying, well, how about this utility? And how about that utility? And how about this? And how about that? And uh, the, the problem was that you know, we had started from Unix. And so it was just, how, did, how do you pull apart you know, out of the utilities, the LS utility? Well, the original Unix had an LS utility. We have an LS utility. Undoubtedly, there's still some code in there that came from the original. So how do we deal with this? Well, Keith Bostick, who was one of the folks that was working at the CSRG with us, uh, said, well, you know, we go to these USENIX conferences uh, every six months, uh, and we always do a, a BOF session. Why don't we just try and, you know, put up a list of all the utilities that we need to have rewritten? And so, you know, it was, you know, big long list of stuff that we needed in the C library and utilities that we needed. And of course, all that trivial stuff starts piling in, you know, cat, someone rewrites cat, woohoo, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. And, and Keith Bostick is, you know, collecting all this and putting it all together. And Mike and I are kind of looking in back and going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but at one point he comes walking into our office and says, well, guys, you know, I've got about 75% uh, of the uh, utilities and libraries uh, rewritten. How, how are you doing on that kernel? Well, you know, we couldn't really use the same technique for the kernel. We couldn't just say, here, rewrite the kernel and, you know, get your name in lights. Uh, and so, but on the other hand, it's looking like, uh, you know, this might actually have be happening. And so what are we going to do? And uh, so the upshot of this is that uh, we, we decide, okay, We'll just, we need to figure out what, what parts of the kernel are, are contaminated. And so we built um, an inverted database. We, we took the, the entire original uh, 32V kernel uh, and ran it through the, the thing that reformatted it for pretty printing to put it in a canonical form. And then we just built a database, which, you know, each entry in the, uh, each line of C code was an entry in the database. And so then we could just take our kernel, do the same, run it through the pretty printer, and then just look up each line in our kernel against that database and see if it matched. Now, obviously, you know, a line with a brace by itself at the end is going to match all over the place. So you throw out that kind of stuff. And then any place where you get a run of like three or four lines that match, you know, four lines from ours match three or four lines in the other one, you'd go and look at it. And you know, a lot of them were false hits, but there were you know, things where we were still doing a, a linear search through some huge table. It's like, you know, why don't we just do a hash lookup on that? And so of course that completely changes the code. And so it, it no longer conflicts. So at any rate, when the dust finally settled, we really had only about six files left that had any you know, significant code still from the original Unix in it. And so our next thought was, well, why don't we just, we'll just rewrite those six files. But then we, we thought better of that because if we released an entire kernel, uh, then AT&T might get upset about that. But we can say, well, this is just a subset of the kernel, you know, and it, it you know, doesn't even compile and run. And, you know, that, that, that wouldn't be nearly as threatening to them. So then the next thing is, of course, we've got to get this licensed by the university, you know, the, through the university lawyers. And it had been such a, aggravating thing to 
do with net one that we decided, you know, instead of doing that, let's just say this is just going to be net two. This is just a, an update to the net one release. We'll just use the net one license. Uh, and the lawyers were more or less okay with that. Um, but, uh, uh, but they said, you know, you, we need, we need you to sh prove to us that this is really, you know, just an update to the old one and not, you know, the new stuff you're at, it isn't going to have anything that comes across. Uh, and uh, that came across from 32V or whatever. So we, uh, we, we need to get your, the, the head of the EECS department to sign off that, you know, they're happy with this. Well, first, I think it was your professor. Well, Bob Fabry had retired at that point, so couldn't get him. And there were no other professors that really wanted to sign off on it. So we went to the head of the department and the head of the department said, yeah, no, I, I'm not signing off on that. And so then we went to the head of the College of Engineering and they weren't willing to sign off on it. And so it just continued up through the ranks. And eventually we got to somebody who was said, well, obviously I don't know enough about it. So it's going to have to actually, you know, you're going to have to hire an expert to come in and really do an analysis. So such an expert was found. And in fact, they did find some things that we had missed. Um, you know, they weren't major things, but there were a few things. And so we went through and they fixed those. And so we got a clean bill of health from them. And we finally got the sign off from the university and out it went. And just like with that one, there were many, 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 many people that were perfectly happy to pay a thousand dollars to get a piece of paper that said, this is, uh, you know, redistributable. So, okay, that's great. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Mike Carls uh, and several, a couple other folks from our community decided to uh, start a BSDI. Uh, so a commercial version of BSD, or a company that would essentially support BSD. And uh, they, they did a few things which in retrospect were probably not ideal. So for example, uh, they, they had ads that said, you know, get Unix for, you know, 90, well, on a 99% discount, uh, you know, 99% less than the cost of getting it from AT&T. And they had the uh, phone number 1-800-ITS-UNIX. So anyhow, this did get the attention of AT&T and AT&T was not amused. So uh, they're, they're, you know, they sent a cease and desist, essentially said, stop selling this product, which infringes on, uh, on our product uh, and of course stop selling it, go out of business basically. And so BSDI was like, uh, no, no, we're not gonna do that. And so AT&T filed a lawsuit uh, saying that, you know, they had stolen AT&T's proprietary software. Uh, and of course, the, the first thing you do if you're a big company, you know, AT&T versus a four or five person company uh, is you get an injunction. You, uh, an injunction basically says what they're doing is so grievous and so harmful to us that the judge will order the company to stop shipping their product until the lawsuit is resolved, which of course is going to probably be years. So essentially it's going to put them out of business. So uh, BSDI is now, you know, facing the, the guns of AT&T's full force coming down on them, trying to get this injunction. And so uh, they go into the, to the court and they say, well, first of all, they, you know, AT&T hasn't even told us what they claim uh, we're infringing on. They just say it's there and we can't possibly respond to it without them telling us what it is that you know, if it's so grievous, it must be obvious what it is, and they should tell us what it is. Uh, and second of all, um, all of our distribution is based on this thing from the University of California at Berkeley. All we did was add these six files, and we wrote these six files in a clean room from scratch with no reference to the AT&T materials, and uh, they haven't made any complaint about any of these six files. And all the rest of this, we have this piece of paper from the University of California that says it's freely redistributable. So 
you know, there's no room for an injunction. Okay, so normally with an injunction, the, the judge just rules, you know, he listens to the two sides and he goes, yes, no, and it's done. Uh, but uh, they can take more time if they want to. And they'll, so, you know, maybe they'll take a couple days to, you know, go and look at some of the written stuff and, and then come up with something. But I mean, all they come up with is, uh, you know, all they're required to come up with is, yes, you get the injunction or no, you don't. I mean, the whole trial, all of that is going to happen down the road. Um, so anyway, um, several days goes by and they, he hasn't, the judge hasn't ruled on the injunction. And so, you know, I'm, the, the, the BSDI is, is saying, well, you know, when's he going to rule? And the, uh, their lawyers say, well, you know, by law, he has four weeks to make up his mind if he wants to. And uh, so a week goes by, two weeks goes by, three weeks goes by. Finally, it's coming up on the Friday or whatever the day of the week was that, you know, the thing had been held and it's four weeks. So that's the day it has to come out. And so we're just like waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And, you know, five o'clock goes by and still not there. And so talk to the the BSDI lawyers and they go, well, you know, what are you going to do? Sue him? You know, he's going to release it when he's going to release it. So anyway, six weeks later, uh, the judge puts out his, his, his ruling. And it's not like one page, yes or no. It goes on for 42 pages. And he lists all 43 grievances that are in the AT&T lawsuit and says, 41 of these are patently absurd, and I'm not even going to let you bring those to court. But there's one of yours is on copyright, and one of them is on trade secret. And of those two, you may have a case, and I'm going to let you bring those to court. But uh, I don't want to hear about any of the others. And secondly, this is really something that should be handled in a state court, not really at the federal level. So uh, and, you know, you can bring it to a federal level once you have a, a, a you know, the losing side of a, of a state court case. Well, uh, no, sorry, I got too far ahead of myself here. First, he said, um, right, so he said, well, yeah, right. He didn't say the state court part, but he laid out the fact that, you know, they didn't really have a case. And so AT&T, rather than following what the judge had said there, uh, decided, okay, what we really need to do is sue the University of California, because we don't see how we're going to get through on just these six files. All right, so now the lawsuit comes to the University of California. They are told they must immediately stop distributing, which they do. It doesn't matter, right? It's already out, so who cares? Uh, uh, but now it's not just BSDI, but it's BSDI plus the university that are going against AT&T. So now you have two big immovable forces beating up against each other. So the, uh, the upshot of this then is that those of us like myself that are still at Berkeley are now getting drawn into it. And normally when you have a case like this, you hire uh, uh, an outside expert to come in and, uh, you know, make your case for you. But the University of California didn't have the money to pay for an expert witness. And so I got to be an expert witness. Um, and uh, so now we, we start off and there have to be things called depositions where uh, the, the, the two sides, you know, basically try and make their case. And, uh, you know, you know, the two sides get to really drill down into the people, into the experts. And, uh, the, uh, the university was kind of dicey about, you know, wh why should we bother, you know, defending this, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, OK, they're going to do it. Um, and so I'm, I'm in my deposition. And uh, the, in my case, there's two lawyers. There's, on one side of me is the lawyer for UC Berkeley. And on the other side is the lawyer for BSDI, because they sort of they've jointly are now in defense. And there's the, the person that's deposing me, who's this super high powered deposing person against little me who's never done this before. And uh, so they, they asked me a question and the, the lawyers are allowed to object to the question. Uh, 
And ultimately, I'm going to always, I'm going to have to answer it, but then the judge will get to decide whether my answer can be used. So the BSCI lawyer jumps in and goes, that's a ridiculous question, blah, 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 you know, on and on, back and forth. And they, you know, finally gets to, you know, why it isn't and why I shouldn't have to answer it and so on. And, uh, you know, so then uh, he asked me to question again. And now the Berkeley lawyer jumps in and th th this, th the guy that's doing the deposing loses it, which is pretty amazing because they're paid not to lose it. And he just looks at the two lawyers and says, ladies, let him answer the damn question. Neither of the two women lawyers appreciated being called ladies by this gentleman from New York. And uh, I just saw Mary McDonald, the, the Berkeley lawyer, I just saw her sort of almost putting her fingers through the table. And at that point, I knew that the University of California was going to back us up and, and follow through on this case because she was not about to let them get away with that. Um, so after that, uh, things went forward. And uh, eventually, we, there's, there's another ruling. And that's the one where the judge says, look, this really should be done in state court first. And the, of course, you, you can't file in multiple states. So whatever state it gets filed in first is the one where it has to be heard. Well, the people, the AT&T is based in New Jersey. And so they, their state court is going to open three hours before the state court in California does. So almost certainly, they've got the weekend. They're going to have that case in at 9 a.m. on Monday morning so that they can establish New Jersey as the state. But for whatever reason, they didn't do that. And so at 9 a.m. in California, they still hadn't filed in New Jersey. So boom, the University of California filed uh, in the, the court in Oakland. Uh, which happened to be across the street from the headquarters of the UC system. And uh, so voila, now it's going to be heard in California. And so, um, and, the, and the first thing that they do is it's now the university on offense against AT&T. And so they filed a claim saying, you know, these AT&T has done all these horrible things. They've taken our code. Uh, they haven't given us due credit. They, you know, are now trying to sue us for stuff that you know they're not even you know isn't even theirs because uh, it turned out they thought that it was TCP/IP that was theirs that we had stolen from them because they would ripped all the copyright notices off. Uh, and anyhow, uh, the, uh, the upshot of this is that uh, they, the two sides decide to go into negotiations, and the negotiations go on for quite a while, but uh, they're not really getting very far. But then um, Ray Norda uh, ends up buying uh, Unix. Uh, and uh, so uh, he and, and he decides that, uh, you know, it's better off to, to fight in the marketplace and not in court. And so he essentially tells the, the USL negotiators that they, they need to just settle it. And so ultimately, um, we get into a room, and it's like we have to, you know, figure out exactly what we're going to do. And you know, it's Mike and I are like looking at each other. It's like, you know, <laughs> there really isn't anything that needs to be taken out. And so we go into the little nego the talk with our lawyer, and she says, "Look, find three things and just get rid of those." And uh, so you know, that 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 that'll that you don't care about much about. And so, you know, we went in and, and uh, you know, picked three files and said, all right, you know, we'll, we'll throw those out. Uh, and so that was basically the settlement. And uh, so then we were allowed to do a new release. Uh, we decided that we would get the license, you know, we would actually go through and get new licensing for that. So that was what finally then came out as uh, 4.4 BSD dash light, L-I-T-E. Uh, because it didn't have the last few bits of, of uh, code that we had agreed to take out. Uh, we also had to add about 90 copyrights, but they were all copyrights uh, that you know, didn't require any uh, licensing to, to use. Uh, so uh, if you look in some of the header files in sys, sys for example, uh, you know, like mount.h probably, or and some of the ones that would have been in the original system, uh, you'll see AT&T copyrights at the top of them, but then saying that you're allowed to use them. 
So I've clearly way overrun my 45 minutes or whatever it was supposed to be. Uh, but why don't I stop there and, and take any questions? And you can run long. We're not, we don't have a hard stop. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I see in the question box, there's one that says, can you comment on the possibly apocryphal story about a truck that happened to drive by and actually dropped off some VMS tapes with virtual memory subsystem code? Um, Why? Well, yes, I could do that. Uh, rolling back in my story, uh, I said there was a, uh, a point where uh, DARPA was trying to decide between whether they would use VMS or Unix. And so a guy named Dave Cashton, who was the, the person who was advocating that they should use VMS, uh, decided to write up a paper on why they should use VMS. And the crux of this paper was uh, a set of 10 bench, what we would today call micro benchmarks uh, that he, would, he ran both on BSD and on VMS. And micro benchmarks were things like how, how many get PIDs can you do per second? Uh, and uh, how many context switches can you do per second? So you'd, you'd set up uh, a, a pair of pipes or a socket between two processes and you'd send one byte back and forth between the two. Uh, and so it was just basically spending all the time context switching back and forth between the two processes. And so, and, 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 and naturally VMS, you know, beat Unix hands down on every one of these 10 micro benchmarks. He probably had some more that it didn't, so he didn't include those. Uh, at any rate, this report comes in uh, and, and Bill Joy, who's running the project at the time, gets this report and he's just, uh, Bill is a very animated person to begin with. And so he's reading this report and he's not just sort of sitting there quietly reading it and turning the pages. Like he reads a page and he takes his pen out and circles something, goes, this is really ridiculous. Rip, throws that page out, starts in on the next one. Oh, this is even worse. I mean, who cares how fast you can do get PID? Um, so anyway, uh, he, he sets about uh, the way you, you deal with things like this, and that is you hack special purpose code to make those particular benchmarks run really fast. So, you know, get PID. Well, you know, turns out you only have to do that system call once, and then you can just cache it as a local variable because your PID isn't going to change on you. And so, you know, you do one system call and then you just take it out of that memory. And then of course it's blindingly fast because you're not doing system calls. Uh, at any rate, of nine of the 10 benchmarks, he, he gets down, you know, at least as good if not better than what VMS did. But the one that's testing the context switch rate just cannot get it up. To, it's, it's, it's about half the context switch rate of, of VMS. And, you know, it's special purpose code that, you know, it's down in the, the low core dot S it's just a sequence of instructions. And, you know, you, you can scratch your head as much as you want, but how are you going to, how are you going to do it any quicker? And uh, I, there was some lamenting that went on with, you know, talking to some folks that we knew at DAC, uh, you know, and uh, at any rate, uh, there was, there's this circle that was out in front of Evans Hall and uh, it, a lot of that's been built over now, but it, it's sort of still there. At any rate, uh, uh, delivery trucks would come around and they would it, you know, drop off like mail or packages or whatever for each of the, the four buildings that were sort of around that circle. And so this, this truck pulls up in front of, uh, from, of, the, of Evans and you know, we're walking back from lunch coming into the building and uh, they have sort of that little tailgate and then the, there's a set of boxes and, and one of the boxes falls off and, and then the truck drives away. And um, so it's like, oh, this paper probably supposed to deliver this. So we look on it and uh, well, there's, there's, it's, we can't figure out who it's supposed to be delivered to. So, well, maybe if we open the box, you know, there'll be like a packing list inside. We'll be able to figure out who it ought to go to. And uh, uh, it looks like it must have been supposed to go to the library because it's filled with microfiche. And uh, well, let, let's go in the library and put the microfiche in. Maybe you know, if we look at it; it'll be obvious, you know, what it is and who it ought to get go to. And uh, the very first microfiche we put into the reader turns out to be the assembly language in VMS that does context switching. I don't know how that happened, but anyway, um, uh, 
we, we pack it all back up and uh, turn it into the library because, you know, most likely they were the ones that were supposed to get it, I guess. Uh, at any rate, we know nothing about it after that. But very unsurprisingly, uh, BSD's context switch starts to go at exactly the same speed as the one in BMS. Uh, so I guess that should hopefully answer your question. OK. Um, Next question is uh, from YouTube. Where did Mount Zainu fit in? Uh, Mount Zainu actually started back in well before uh, a lot of these other pieces took place. Uh, what was happening was in the original release, 4.3 BSD, uh, it was you know not fully polished, let's just say. And uh, there were a lot of people that were getting vaxes and they need they, they wanted to run bsd on it but if they didn't have the exact machines that we had at berkeley uh then they often had trouble getting it up and running and so a set of people that had been in the system administration group at berkeley uh decided to start their own company to provide support for people that wanted to use bsd help them get it up on their machines if they had specialized hardware, they could help them write device drivers for it. Uh, and also to just, it, Unix was changing very rapidly at that point in time. And so each time Berkeley would do a new release, they would then get that release brought out and integrated into their, their customers' uh, systems. And they needed to come up with a name for the company. And uh, they did, you know, originally you, you'd want to have something that sort of had Unix in the name, but they could, if you had Unix, then you had to have a little thing that said Unix is a trademark of AT&T. Uh, so they decided to, uh, to just do it backwards. And so uh, Mount Zainu is Unix TM backwards. And that's where the name came from. All right. Surely we have some more questions here. I'm looking over on IRC to see if I can see what else you might have. Oh, uh, here comes one. How hard would it be to implement a system call to link a file descriptor to a normal file in a directory on the same file system? I think they mean something like flink, where you have an unlinked file that's been deleted, but you still have an open file descriptor to it. Ah. Uh reinstantiate a directory entry forward in the file system. Um, that would not be difficult to do. Uh, the, uh, I mean, you, you might have some security implications there because for example, someone might have passed you a file descriptor to give you access to something, but you know, they don't want you to, you know, have a long-term copy of it or something. But on the other hand, I mean, you could just make a copy of it. So I don't really see how it would be that horrendous, but I would want to think about it before I would implement something like that because, uh, you know, there could be some evil way that you could do something with something like that. Okay. Um, what about the mock operating system? Where does that fit in? Also, what was lost in BSD as a result of the lawsuit? Um, that well, I'll answer the what was lost in BSD as a result of the, the lawsuit was uh, the things that we really hated uh, that we emulated in uh, System Five, and that was Shamem and uh, the the uh, the shared locking thing that they had, and whatever the other third one of those is. I, I don't remember right off the top of my head now. Uh, Unfortunately, those were used enough that uh, eventually they, those those features got re-implemented. But that was actually some years down the line, uh, and that that was actually done not at Berkeley. Once once that BSD got released, um, it was done by you know, FreeBSD or NetBSD or one one of the BSDs, and then propagated to the rest of them. And what about the mock operating system? Where does that fit in? So one of the, the big things that was, was very popular uh, in the 80s, uh, there were actually two things, both of which I thought were horrendous ideas that got beat upon endlessly. 
Um, one was this notion of a microkernel. So you have a, the, your kernel is really just uh, uh, scheduling and uh, VM management and maybe a bit of device driver stuff. Uh, but everything else runs out in user land. So your, your file systems are out there, your networking stacks are out there, uh, and then everything is done with message passing. So instead of having uh, subroutine calls or system calls, you're, you're doing message passing. And so of course the message passing needs to be blindingly fast and uh, inevitably is you're, you're never gonna get it to the point where it's as fast as doing a subroutine call or a system call. And so uh, the, we, we weren't huge fans of that. Oh, and distributed shared memory was the other one that was just like an idea that, that just never caught on because you, you know, the, the overhead of you know, every time you took a page fault having to go to some other machine to get the answer was just not plausible uh, as, as being usable. Anyway, uh, but, you know, so, so Mach was all about the microkernel, but they needed all those other things that were uh, like file systems and so on. And so they took BSD and kind of put that on top uh, of the, the, the Mach microkernel. Well, the, uh, the upshot of that was that we wanted to uh, take the, the VM system that they had, but of course that was all this you know, message passing stuff. So we took that out of the microkernel and put it in as the VM in the, in the BSD kernel. Uh, but then on top of it, we changed it from the, the whole message passing thing to, to the interface we have today, which is MMAP and MProtect and you know, the, the, the M set of uh, uh, system calls. And uh, the, there was a lot of stuff that was in there that uh, was, was ideas that they'd had that they tried out and didn't you know, might or might not be particularly useful, but the code was still there. So there was a whole lot of stuff, for example, to have an external pager so that when you take a page fault, uh, it would send a message over and let some user level process deal with handling the page fault. And then it would send back and say, okay, it's been dealt with now. Uh, you can imagine how unreliable that could get. And so uh, we, we just lopped that off, but there was all the code inside the VM system that was uh, you know, designed to handle the fact that paging might be an event that was gonna be handled you know, externally and so on. And uh, even though we didn't have any intent of having that happen, we still went through all of the overhead of having that stuff there. So uh, David Green and Lawrence basically went through and just at some point just got rid of all that. So he just sort of roto-rooted uh, what was in the, the VM system and uh, got it down to sort of the core of what we, we think of uh, today. And of course, you know, others like Alan Cox and Caustic have done huge amounts of work uh, to add things like uh, super pages and uh, a lot of other uh, functionality to the, to the uh, VM system. Uh, so it's evolved a great deal over time. So it doesn't really look very much like the mock VM system anymore, but uh, it, uh, it, that's where it started from. Okay. Uh, do you miss any VAX features when porting to other architectures? Uh, there were um, uh, some, in, it, the VAX was the, you know, the, sort of the, the extreme of, of complex instruction architectures. Well, that's actually not true because the Intel architecture is way outstripped in terms of number of instructions, different instructions. But at the time it was way out in the lead. And you know it had instructions like CRC that would do a CRC calculation for you. And uh, there was, but there, there were some string instructions which were quite handy like find first set, which would find, you know, you, you'd give it a, a vector and it would find the first bit that was set in that vector. Uh, and so, you know, it, you still see vestiges of where we utilize those instructions. Uh, the, uh, when, when you wanted to use one of the VAX instructions, we would write it as a, a subroutine call. So you would just say FFS and give the arguments. And so that would push the arguments onto the stack uh, and then call that function. And then we would run a post processor over it 
a, a, a well-known post processor called sed and it would look for the places where you called that uh, function and it would replace the call to the function by the in, the instruction uh, the magic instruction on the vax and then that was later done where instead of pushing things on the stack it moved them into registers and made it go quicker uh etc but uh the point was that you know we sort of had some of those vax special instructions uh you know power factored into uh our system and you know today they're just functions like the way they're written uh but uh, uh you know it was faster when you actually had the instruction on the vax that would do it um, but other than that, the uh, you know the the move forward uh, in in uh, the the way that paging works and so on, uh, you know, the, the VAX was very well designed for a 32-bit architecture. But uh, what we have in it wouldn't work all that well in a 64-bit architecture today. So uh, for the most part, other than the the vestiges of some of those instructions, not really too much of the VAX that I still would go back to. If I had to write an assembly language, of course, I'd love it. But thankfully, I don't have to do that much anymore. Um, if you could redo the FFS on disk format, what, if anything, would you change? Uh, the, the only thing that I'm really gunning for right now is that the inode number should be 64 bits. Uh, so that, of course, would change the format of directories uh, and a few other things. Uh, most of the rest of the changes that I wanted, basically, I got put in when we did FFS2. Uh, so we went to 64-bit uh, block pointers and increased the size of inodes and got external uh, data, which unfortunately got lobotomized, so it can only be used for uh, extended credentials. But uh, it was originally designed like the file forks in, in Apple's OS, where you can put sort of arbitrary things out there. Uh, so I guess that's, you know, the, other than that, I the, 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 there's nothing else that majorly I would want to change. Uh, there's always been a question, I guess, of, of going to an extent-based uh, block numbering. But, you know, at this point in time, it, it, that doesn't seem to be all that useful. OK. How does L4 IPC compare to mock IPC? Uh, is that like SCL4 maybe? I'm not sure what John is asking. I assume he means the socket interface, level four. Oh, oh okay. Um, they're, they're really quite different. I, the, 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 the mock IPC is active messages. So when you, you send something in, uh, I guess you, you could sort of say it's like a datagram uh, in the socket interface where you, you, you put it in and it's you know a local address. So it's just going to a different port on your machine. Uh, that's sort of be the closest analogy I could think of to the, the mock IPC. But the, the, the mock IPC has all these uh, you know mailbox and notification and other things, um, which, I mean, we have mechanisms in the in the OS now that that could do those things, but uh, not nearly in the efficiency that Mock had it done because they they I mean they really had to tune that thing down to to get those things through the kernel as fast as possible. All right, true or false? Sys slash Q dot H started out life as a simple wrapper over early VAX instructions. Um, I, well, I was the one that first wrote Q.H. Um, and we had list and tail queues, and that was it. Uh, actually, we had a thing called circle queues, but that, that was a dumb idea and got dropped fairly quickly. Uh, and the thing that motivated me to write it was because uh, essentially, Every time I wanted to do a linked list, I had to go find a place in the kernel where we already had one and pick up those four lines of code and then edit them to be the right thing. And I'm like, I'm really tired of doing this. And so I simply came up with a way of codifying them in the, in the macros. Uh, and uh, so 
in fact, the, the tail queue macros is, is essentially what I originally did. And then it became clear that there were places where we didn't want to waste the, the, the memory. And so the, the list got added second. But the, the, there were no VAX instructions that particularly made that harder or easier to do. So uh, I would say it, that was really just a thing because I was sick, sick and tired of cutting and pasting. Uh, I had no idea, of course, that it would grow to the to the level of what it is today. It, it's amazing to me to to look at that, and it's just like, oh my god! I look at the original one, and it was like a hundred lines, and this this one, you know, it looks like War and Peace when you go to read it, which is not bad. I mean, I'm glad that people thought it was a good idea, and if you notice, even Linux picked it up, uh, although they they're about 15 years behind the ones that we have. Maybe someday they'll pick up some of the other stuff. All right. Um, do you ever feel behind in how fast technology moves and seeing so much of it? Uh, actually, you know, very few people uh, get to work on essentially the same thing through their whole career. Uh, and in fact, most people would probably shudder at, you know, having to work on the same thing through their whole career. But I'll argue that you know, the things I was working on in the 80s wasn't the same as the 90s and it wasn't the same as the 00s and so on. Uh, so, uh, you know, it is exciting to both have the technology moving quickly around you and yet still being able to ride the wave on and on and on and on. Um, what really helps is the fact that there's the FreeBSD project and there's all these people that are younger and more nimble than me that are really the ones that are keeping on top of that technology. So now it's more a matter of sitting and watching the fast technology evolve than you know, actually having to dive in. You know, there's still a few places where I, I will go in and, and you know, lob in some suggestions and about half the time people will go, what are you thinking? You're like, oh yeah, never mind." And then the other time they go, well, that might have some merit. You know? And so some of those things are, are still going in and, and there's some things that people just really don't want to look at at all like FSCK. And so when, when one of those breaks, it's like <laughs> McCusick fix it. <laughs> but, uh, and, and even there, you know, that's, that's a lot of technology. I mean, it, things like trim didn't exist, you know, 20 years ago. And so a lot of the stuff that has to go in to deal with that, uh, is, is things that, uh, I've actually had a bit of a hand in, but uh, generally speaking, uh, it 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 is it's very cool to be able to watch the technology go by and seeing how it's being adapted and used, uh, and so I feel very lucky to be where I am in that regard. Okay, the I four microkernel family. So I think this was L4. I think John was saying, or, or Jan, oh. uh, I think what he was saying was he was talking about IPC in the L4 microkernel, which I am not familiar with. So I have no idea how it might compare to the IPC that was in Mach. Yes, I, um, I, I'm with you on that. I, I have not studied L4 at all. So, okay. Um, should the kernels get headers for any other data structures like Q.H and Tree.H? Uh, undoubtedly it should, uh, but, and, and in fact, things like that are coming in, uh, but they, they don't have nearly the, the broad level of, uh, applicability across, uh, you know, large parts of the system. I mean, Q.H gets used not only in the kernel, but also gets used in a lot of user code as well. And, uh, the, uh, you know, there's relatively few things that have such a, a broad usage base, but there, you know, you know, all kinds of little things have come in over time um, that that kind of codify uh, things that that do get used in in several places in the kernel, and and so that kind of refactoring I think is is ongoing. Um, it just isn't quite as obvious. Uh, so some of the things that get refactored bubble up because they turn out once they've been refactored to have much broader applicability than they were originally intended for. Uh, and, you know, so undoubtedly some of those are there or will be there and will eventually percolate up. Okay, um, will checksumming be part of UFS3? The, the short answer to that is no. Uh, 
uh, there was one time there was a time when I thought that that was something that would in fact be useful to do and I've come to realize that uh, there are uh, we, we really have two major local file systems in FreeBSD UFS and ZFS and uh, ZFS being non-overwriting file system technology, it's just way, way, way easier to do checksumming in that kind of a technology of a file system because once something is written, you know it's never going to be overwritten. So the checksum for it is going to be accurate for as long as it's valid data. Uh, and secondly, you want the checksum not to be in the data block that you're checksumming. It needs to be elsewhere. Uh, and ZFS is set up perfectly to do that. To overhaul UFS to be able to do that would require a great deal of added, a, a, a great deal of changes and a lot more code. And, uh, and it, to boot in an overwriting file system, it, it's just not as gonna be as reliable because of constantly needing to have things change, overwriting things and then having to get the checksums to change and keeping those things in sync. And then you need a log to do that. And, it, it's just, it's way too much work. Um, so really, uh, I now view UFS not as the end-all be-all file system for every use, which is what it started out as, but rather as a small, very efficient file system. So for small file systems, embedded systems, where you don't need all the functionality and reliability of ZFS. If what you need is that level of reliability, you should be using ZFS. Uh, so if, if you want and need the, the, the reliability of checksums, use ZFS because that's, they do it better than I could ever do it in UFS. And uh, so, my, so my goal uh, has been to uh, not add more features to, to UFS, but rather to uh, make what we already have there run absolutely as, as fast as possible, uh, but still to keep its footprint down. Uh, so, you know, if you take out the, the ability to do snapshots, you take out uh, the journaling, you take out the soft updates, you know, you don't enable those options. The, 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 the core UFS is actually pretty tiny still. And, uh, you know, it, it, would, it would clock in at around 10,000 lines of code compared to, for example, ZFS, which is 750,000 lines of code. Uh, so, you know, if, if space is an issue, uh, then uh, UFS, UFS is there to, to help you out with that. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, when you get to super huge file systems, again, they, they, you know, if it takes you 24 hours to run FSCK on it, then that's just not a viable thing to do. Whereas with ZFS, you, you still have the equivalent of FSCK, but it's called scrub and it just kind of runs in the background and it can start and stop. And, uh, you know, yeah, sure. It takes a couple of days to perhaps, or maybe a week to scrub the whole thing. But, you know, the fact that the system got rebooted or, you know, you had to stop it because, you, you know, the system was too busy. You didn't want to burn the, the IO cycles at that point in time. That's all doable. And, and to try and do that with FSCK is just not plausible. So um, acknowledge that the things that ZFS is good at is, is you know, it's good at. And if, the, if you need those kind of features, then you should be running ZFS because presumably you will have a 64-bit processor and you will have 64, you know, gigabytes of memory to support it and, and you know, so on. And then, you know, but you're not going to be running ZFS in your wristwatch, you know. Probably not even going to be running UFS in your wristwatch, but whatever. Okay, so in, in moving forward with UFS three, um, if you heard my talk maybe a decade ago, I would have I had a much different list of things that I wanted to put in there than what I want to put in today. So I, where where it's easy to do things checksumming, it's actually check CRCs, but uh, for things like inodes. Um, they're in there for the super blocks, for the cylinder groups. So some of those core things where it's, it's easy to do it, it's there now. Uh, and in places where it requires using a journal to track the changes, it's not in and probably never will be. There, that's how to spend 10 minutes on a 30 second question. Oh, that's fine. Um, we do have a couple of questions from YouTube. So I, I wanna be a good custodian of your time since you're giving us so much time today. 
Um, so maybe a question from YouTube. My uh, Kevin Bowling had asked, were there any other protocol war protocol wars that happened during CSRG aside from TCP/IP? Um, other protocol wars. There, I mean, yes, but they, they were much more niggling. Um, I mean, there were a lot of the RFCs that came out in that era. So, for example, a bunch of things having to do with with SMTP with mail systems. Uh, we had a lot of debates going back and forth on uh, some of the things, some of the uh, uh, things like slow start and how that ought to be implemented and Nagel's algorithm and, and things like that. But, you know, those mostly got, uh, you know, they, they were a little like side skirmishes. There wasn't just the, the huge head butting um, that we had with the, the original TCP IP. I think we learned something from that original TCP IP. I mean, you know, I, to honestly, we at Berkeley did not do a very good job of handling that uh, from start to finish because we just didn't even realize it would be an issue. And so, you know, having learned that lesson, we made sure to cut those kind of things off at the pass by getting everybody engaged early on before people were in entrenched positions. Okay, uh, what can you tell us about gaming console specific optimizations for FFS? I assume you're talking about the Sony PlayStation. Um, I, I, Sony PlayStation uh, uses FreeBSD, as I assume people know, and uh, they had originally planned to do their own file system, but the, the, they got kind of stuck and they were needing to ship and it wasn't working. Uh, but they needed to uh, get something going. And one of the things they needed was that each level in a game had to be contiguous on the disk so they could just seek around and you know, directly manipulate the disk rather than have to go through the file system. So they needed uh, 10 megabyte disk blocks. And so I had to do some work to help them be able to get FFS to do that for them. Um, but that's the only optimization that, that I was involved in. Other than that, it pretty much just worked for them as far as I know. Uh, any hints on PS5 file system? Are they still using UFS? Uh, I have not been contacted by them, so I do not know the answer to that. Um, well, I think because we're getting a little late and we had, a, <clears throat> there's one last question I wanted to ask you. It actually came from Emmanuel Vado on IRC, who hacks on graphics and things, but it's a bit of a forward looking question. So let me read it correctly so that I don't misstate it. Um, so Manu says, question for Kirk, as an old timer, and he said I had to use those words, sorry. Um, how do you feel about FreeBSD today and the other BSDs? For example, how do you feel in terms of the direction that we take? And that can be either technical or how we do our project management. Uh, what are your kind of thoughts about where the projects are and where they're going? <clears throat> 